Good evening, everyone. Hear me okay? Great. It's good to be here with you tonight. Well, I've had the good fortune to be on retreat for uh, six days, five days. I did a short retreat with Tanisra and Kitty Saro. It was really, it was really a wonderful experience. So tonight I'd like to bring in some of what has inspired me over the past week or so practicing with them, especially since we've been reading and studying together from their wonderful book, Listening to the Heart, which we're about two thirds of the way through now, just about to begin working through chapter 12. So if you're following along, we'll dig more into the meat of the chapter next week. Um, but this week we'll kind of give an overview. And as always, I'll share not so much a step-by-step -step, uh, walking through the chapter, but more of just my, my way of making sense of their teachings and relating to their dharma in the way that I can. I'm going to share in the chat in just a second. Um, a link to a document that has some chants on it. One of the wonderful lessons of being on retreat with Tanisra and Kitty Saro was that every moment is a moment for Dharma. So just watching them gracefully and easefully work through technology problems when they arose or chatting with each other to get the essence of the sutta that they were working through in real time, not portraying themselves as experts, but just sharing their practice and experience was really um, beautiful to me and exemplified something that I think as practitioners, we all um, would be wise to embody just this idea of being a learner and somebody who's working, not somebody who's arrived. Let me see if I can do this again. I was telling my partner er either earlier that my dog Sasha has been my best teacher for helping me um, inch a little bit closer to the parami of patience. You've heard me share some stories about walking her and our adventures together. <laughs> and I will have to say that we've been learning to negotiate a lot more easefully these days. And at least I've, I've had a, a great teacher to practice patience, which may be supporting us right now. So Tanisara and Kitty Saro really um, have a strong chanting practice. Um, I think Kitty Saro said that he's been chanting the Great Compassion Mantra every day for about 30 years and they do some chanting together. And that was a big part of our retreat experience. So I'd like to do a little chanting tonight to, to begin with. And so if you've opened the document, you'll see that right for the first page is our Wednesday night chants. And I'll find a way to put these on the website or on the calendar, probably better on the public calendar so that you can access them. But I'll also work with Jessica, one of us, probably Jessica will remember better than me. <laughs> Maybe link to this in the chat each week so that you don't find it easily at your fingertips and you'll have it right here. But 
the, the value for me and it, there's a lot of value in chanting. I've been doing a lot more of, of chanting and reciting teachings in lyrical form these days. And there's, there's value in the um, recitation of the words like from on a conceptual level is understanding that deepens as we say something back as we receive the words and then repeat it back. And also it's a different way of embodying the teachings. Song activates a different part of our brain. And so perhaps we can um, think about chanting in this way, like using our whole system a little more efficiently. And it might feel weird to you if you haven't done much chanting. We do some chanting at Common Ground, but not a lot. And so if it feels like something new and you don't quite understand or know how to relate to it, that's perfectly acceptable. It's a really great place to begin. So there's nothing that needs to be fixed if that's where you're coming to this with. Part of the practice and the process of learning something new or which every moment is new for us, leaning into the, the next moment with mindfulness and wisdom is about just telling the truth. So we wanna tell the truth as we chant together. And even if it feels weird or we don't know what we're doing or we don't feel a deep resonance, I have deepened into a practice of chanting over many years, so it didn't just happen overnight. And for sure, over the last few years, um, doing a little bit more of that, and for sure, in the last year, heavily relying on chanting in my practice. And I neglected to mention that Tanissa and Kitty Sara were teaching with a dear friend of mine, Yang Oh, who has been a student of theirs for a long time. And Yang is a really um, beautiful human who also does a lot of chanting and being in relationship and friendship with him. And I've learned to, I've absorbed a lot of his devotion and commitment to Dharma through chanting. So this first page I think um, is really nice. It's something that they offered at the retreat. Um, let me just, in case some of you dropped in recently, a little more recently, I posted in the chat a document that we're going to do a little chanting from. And so I'll just read this, some of the benefits of chanting as they see it. Honoring that which is worthy of honor. This is the highest blessing, which is a chant that we did together on retreat that I might bring it in later, but not tonight. Honoring that which is worthy of honor. And then bringing body, mind, and heart together in, to wholehearted alignment with refuge. This is really taking in the power of refuge to celebrate and embody that, to feel into the blessing of connecting with the ancient lineage of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, the great masters and dedicated practitioners. So it's putting us right in lineage with so many other wise beings who have preceded us going back 2,600 years to the time of the Buddha. And, you know, it would be remiss to not acknowledge that this lineage has been, these practices have been carried forward by our Asian siblings. Tibetan, Burmese, Indian, Sri Lankan, Chinese, Japanese, Thai, and on and on. So we can really um, appreciate that as we place ourselves in relationship with, with them. And then number three, to unify and compose the body and mind around that which is wholesome, blameless, and trustworthy. 
So it's like when we say the words, when we, we recite the chant, we can allow our whole heart, our body to be absorbed with this goodness that we speak to. Number four, to establish a practical and tangible bridge between subtle dimensions of meditative dharma and interactive contact of daily life. Five, memorizing teaching so that they become integrated and metabolized into the fabric of our being. With the limited and personal body, speech, and mind connecting with the unlimited, unbounded, timeless, selfless qualities of heart. And if you're following along in the book, you probably recognize this word timeless. Kitty Saro mentions the timeless quite often. And then number seven, invoking protection, healing, and blessing for self and others. Often at Common Ground, we'll chant the four quarters chant, which I've got here on our list to perhaps chant tonight. But that's one way of invoking protection, to invoke the protection of the Brahma Viharas, of metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, mudita, gladness, equanimity. Cultivating samadhi and mental agility, keeping the mind nimble through memorization and reflecting on meaning and allowing the body to express it. And then using mantra and sacred name to develop non-proliferation. Non-proliferation is one way to describe nibbana an equanimous perspective on cognitive faculty to contemplate the unmoving in the midst of movement, right? the stability of heart in the midst of the flow of life. Using chanting and recitation for the sake of sacred ceremony, which is ceremony is one way to describe a process so we're all in process together as Dharma practitioners, as students here, even in the room as we show up on a Wednesday night. And then celebrating with others, sensing the transformative harmony, selflessness, and power of Sangha, blessing all beings. So we can really hold this activity of chanting as a way of giving and receiving, of participating wholeheartedly in life, of receiving the teachings in perhaps new and um, inspiring ways. So we're gonna do a little bit of chanting now. And we'll start with the Refuges and Precepts on page two. And the first line is Pali, the language spoken at the time of the Buddha, and the second line, obviously, in English. And so you'll see that pattern throughout. Uh, the first, we'll do Namo, Tasa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama, Sambuddhasa, say that three times. And then we will um, go to the Buddha for refuge go to the Dhamma for refuge, go to the Sangha for refuge, and then that word Dutiampi, that means for the second time, and then that word Tatiampi, which means for the third time. So some of you are in Buddhist studies and you might recognize this one, something that we chant at Buddhist studies practice on Monday nights. And then I thought we would take the, uh, take the precepts together tonight. And this is a way to orient our hearts in the direction of non-harming. And it can be a really um, wise way to begin a day, to begin a retreat, to begin a ceremony, such as a practice night like tonight. So taking the, re taking the precepts is one way of making a commitment to participating skillfully in this world. 
You'll notice the first one, undertaking the training to refrain from intentionally taking life. And then the second one is to refrain from taking that which is not given, stealing. And then the third one is undertaking the training to refrain from misusing sexuality in the senses, using our sexuality, using sense pleasure skillfully. Undertaking the training to refrain from speech that is false, divisive, harsh, and meaningless, purifying our speech. And then the fifth one, undertaking the training to refrain from intoxication that leads to carelessness. So let's start with the refuges and precepts tonight, and then perhaps we'll chant a couple more just for maybe 10 or so minutes, and then we'll move right into a sitting period. Are you game for something new tonight? Yeah, some, 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 yes, yeah, some, give me like this if you're kind of in and kind of, all right, <laughs> cool. You can be kind of in and kind of out. You can be totally in or you can be not, not feeling it, but just willing to stay and see how it goes. So you can um, chant along with me if you'd like, but I'll, I'll keep myself unmuted so you can hear. And if you wanna just receive, you can just do that too. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Bhutam Sarnam Gachami Dhamam Sarnam Gachami Sangam Sarnam Gachami Dutyampi Bhutam Sarnam Gachami Dutyampi Dhamam Sarnam Gachami Dutyampi Sangam Sarnanga Chami Tatyampi Bhutam Sarnanga Chami Tatyampi Dhamam Sarnanga Chami Tatyampi Sangam Sarnanga Chami Anati pata veramani sika padam samadhyami Adina dana veramani sika padam samadhyami Kame sumi chachara sika padam samadhyami Musawada veramani sika padam samadhyame Sura maria majapamada tana veramani sika padam samadhyame And then we'll scroll down to page two and we'll chant the suffusion with the divine abiding. This is what we call the four quarters chant. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and 
to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with gladness, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with equanimity. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. We'll go down to the last page and we'll end with a mantra, this, the first one. Revere the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. We'll just do this three times. Buddha, 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 one day, Dhamma, 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 one day, Sangha, 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 one day, Buddha, Sangam, Sangam, 
the words reverberate in the heart. You can remember this possibility, this possibility of having a non-contentious relationship to life, to experience, to each other. And somehow this is what all of the teachings are pointing us to. Reminding us that nothing needs to be left out. And even if we don't know it in every moment, Remember the possibility of a non-contentious relationship. As the sound evaporates into the ether, remember that there's no sense in holding on. It's only letting go. And just take some time and feel into what's moving in the heart. See if it's possible to relate without contentiousness. And to not hold on. to participate by being in the flow. Flow of emotion. The flow of body. The only thing that we really need to do is practice receiving every experience with ease. It 
Notice, no problem.
And opening your eyes when you're ready. Go ahead and take a few minutes if you'd like to stretch your legs. It seems like we're living in a profound moment in, in time in the United States and all over the world, really. With a, a lot of exposure and visibility. And a real call for us to figure it out. to really ask ourselves some of the deepest questions like what am I doing with my life and what really matters and also to question how we're participating skillfully in relationship with each other and as citizens Prior to this retreat that I just finished, I was feeling a bit run down, depleted. Not because I was so busy, really, but just I think the heaviness of some of the inquiries At the heart of the matter is how to live a contemplative life, a spiritual life, a life that honors the sacred and honors our Buddhist practice deeply. And also how to engage, what are the most skillful ways to engage in the, in the fight, right, for racial justice, fight for equity, the fight to honor every living being, to help be a force of that. Deepest love, the expression of the deepest love and the collective, like how to participate in transformation. And as I've said before, there's so many moments when the amount of suffering or the depth of suffering can really feel overwhelming. And it's actually in these moments or has been in these moments for me that this heart kind of gives up its striving, learns to let go. And in that learning to let go, there is this really nourishing experience of 
realizing that we're not going to somehow transcend or outsmart samsara. We're not going to somehow transcend suffering. That the only way to live, the only way towards transformation and healing is actually right through, right through the depths of pain and not knowing, it's this not knowing, this surrendering to not knowing that kind of reveals the depth of the practice, the depth of the teachings. It's said that, you know, in the teachings on karma that we're really so lucky to be born into a human form, to take birth in this human form, and even luckier to, more fortunate to, come across the Dharma. So I've been just like keeping this in mind, like how fortunate it is to be born into this human form where we're so porous, so sensitive, and to have this practice that sensitizes us more, that sensitizes me even more. Because it's right in these, you know, these moments of like, ah, oh, this pain, not, I'm not sure what to do. Oh, maybe the right move is to just surrender to the, I don't know what to do, to surrender to the not knowing and to receive the teachings through this participation, this kind of participation with life, this non-contentious participation with life. And this real, this koan that exists right here, well, you know, how to care so deeply and be engaged, how to know my responsibility as a citizen and as a human being to my own experience, right? How to take care, how to feel the emotions, how to not pretend that this heart is scared or angry or resisting, saying no, bracing, how to take responsibility for participating skillfully in these moments and to not make the mistake of attachment in these moments. Like somehow I'm gonna reach the goal and all of a sudden there's gonna be no more difficulty. That's just never gonna be the case. Remember it's a privilege to be born into this human form. It's a privilege to know this suffering. The suffering is our teacher. Every difficult moment is our teacher. Every difficult moment teaches us how to live into this seemingly impossibility, right? Oh, responsibility, take responsibility, take some action. Purify my speech. Don't forget, sweetie, that you're participating in every moment, that every act of action related to cultivating a healthy, skillful livelihood is precisely what the Buddha talked about in the Noble Eightfold Path. And so as we as we learn, as we realize more and more that we are here to learn, that we're not here to be perfect, that no matter how we shake it, there's going to be, there's going to be, a, there's going to be problems. There's going to be conflict. Right? Because we're all doing this work. And some of us are fortunate to have found the teachings. And we can really take them to heart. And we can also be really humbled by the expression of greed, the expression of delusion, the expression of hatred that flows through these human forms and creates all kinds of difficulties that we see manifest in 
wild ways. Like, oh yeah, this too, this too belongs in our collective expression of humanity. This is how by touching this, by getting close, by learning how to be sensitive in, in every moment, this heart learns, oh, I don't have to turn away. And there's in that reality that, oh, I don't have to turn away. Then this heart learns, oh, there's no, there's no point in holding tightly to anything. My views, my identities, my ideals about how things should go. When we rely on the conceptual frameworks that we have, the stories in our minds about how we should do life, there's, it's limited, right? We're never gonna really transform or heal in that very limited way. But as spiritual beings, we, through this process of becoming more sensitive, feeling more, learning how to acknowledge, to tell the truth, right? That action of speech, telling the truth, not just knowing the truth, but telling the truth, participating skillfully, being responsible. This is how, this is how we transform. I was talking to a dear friend after a dear Dharma friend, another teacher, after these, it was a five day retreat and I extended the time of it. This friend has practiced with Tanisa and Kitty Saro quite a bit. And just said, how was it? And, and I just said something like nothing left out. And this is what we, this is what we learn. This is the heart, nothing left out. No part of humanity left out. No part of our own experience left out. Our identity is not left out. The heart that is unskillful, that reacts, that does stupid things. You know, these human forms, we do stupid things. That's not left out either. There's a place for that. We connect with sensitivity. We learn how to take responsibility. We learn how to make amends. We learn how to repair. We learn how to do the ongoing work of repair. And that's some way, in some ways, that's how we can think about our participation in the collective, our responsibility as citizens. It's like this continuous participation in repair. You know, human beings have made a mess out of things for centuries and we're the recipients of that. And so my active engagement in any way is an activity of repair. It's like I'm taking responsibility for greed and hatred and delusion for the mix of it, right? Some good, some wholesome, some skillful, some expression of greed. Oh, that's here in this heart. That was my ancestors' hearts. It's in the children. We're still really grateful to be in this human form and we're still a mess. So every time I attend a direct action or make a phone call to my Congress person or write letters or lead a group or have a hard conversation, it's my taking response, my doing my part, participating skillfully, responsibly, because we're never, we don't ever get a pass. That is what we're always doing, participating. And yet that orientation in the direction of letting go helps remind us that there's not an end to that. 
it doesn't, it's not useful to think about a goal you know, once we get this law passed or once the trial is over, once Chauvin is convicted of murder, then we'll, we'll really, we'll have a, arrived somewhere. Well, that's not the end of my participation, even if there's good news like that. Because it's an ongoing responsibility. And I can do that, we can do that, we can make that choice, we can relate wholeheartedly to life in this way because we understand something about attachment. We understand that it doesn't help us. We can feel that. You know, I can, I can feel that really in living color. When I'm strident about something, when I'm a Shelly that needs to be right. Oh, that, it hurts, it's painful. Do you know that feeling? Yeah. Or how about when the heart is just tied up in knots about something and it feels like no matter what you do, no matter what we do, it just won't release, right? Try everything. But what we fail to see is that we're trying to make something happen. It's not enough ease, not enough receiving that's there. And so again, another moment, a teacher. That letting go is a part, is how we learn that not to have goal. that we participate because we're creating something. Together we participate because we're grateful that we have this life to learn, this life to transform, this life to heal. Nothing left out. Every part of us is welcome. Chapter 12 is called The Wounded Warrior, authored by Tanisara. It starts with this quote by a 16th century uh, look at my notes, Hindu poet, I think. Mira, yes, mystic poet, devotee of Krishna. Only the wounded understands the agonies of the wounded. I almost couldn't make it past that first line <laughs> to read the chapter. Only the wounded understand the agonies of the wounded. And this is a bit what I was just pointing to when we realize that our we have this opportunity to learn and what we're all doing in this messy existence that we're living collectively is honoring the skillful and the skill unskillful that resides in every heart. It's like realizing that you're not different than me. You're doing your job. You're, work, you're waking up the best you can, and so am I. And there's nothing but the heart, you know, but for the heart to break when that is really seen deeply. Last night at the Truth and Justice Vigil, which I highly recommend if you haven't been there yet, it's a wonderful program every Tuesday night, six o'clock to 7.30, through the trials of all of the officers charged with murder of George Floyd at different teacher will be there leading, holding the space so that we can, you know, teachers will share some teachings, they'll provide some opportunities for us to talk and process and just be with what's moving in the heart. This is the creative genius of both Ayo Yatende and Stacy McClendon. And each Tuesday, the, it will be held, the space will be held by an African descended Buddhist teacher. So it's a wonderful opportunity to hear from so many 
so many, so many voices. Last night, Ralph Steele was there and his parting comments, something like, um, your homework is to look at everybody you see and don't turn away until you see yourself in them. It's not verbatim, it's just my paraphrasing. Look at everybody you see and don't turn away until you see yourself in them. This is our shared humanity. We have to be deeply humbled by the expressions of greed and hatred and delusion in the world and realize that we too are participating because we are a mixed bag. Right? None of us here have completely, well, I mean, let me just speak for myself. I have not arrived. My path is not yet complete. <laughs> Only the wounded understands the agonies of the wounded. So that sensitivity, that suffering, that lands, oh, we know that pain, right? That lands in us because our heart is sensitive to it because we know it. This is a little bit more from Tanisara. Awakening is to return to our natural state while our agendas complicate life and contrast our natural state is simple. It isn't planning or anxious, it just is. There is no fear of loss and no big accomplishment to gain. Awakening, said the Buddha, is here and now, timeless and ever inviting us inward. It is not a special experience we can capture. Although I have experienced awakenings, they are now memories, like fading butterflies. Awakening isn't an experience, it's an end of experience. We don't need a unique experience to notice the truest thing we can say about ourselves, that we simply are. So every moment that we touch into something difficult, and I've been listening to the trials, I've been using it as practice to really tune in, to see if I can understand, see if I can really get close to the truth. And then to speak the truth out loud to friends or others that I'm talking about the trials with. And so this practice of receiving the pain of the collective, receiving the pain of this heart and learning how to let it move, invite its movement, no need to hold on, no need to reject. Yes, this is the truth of things. This is the mess that we're in. There's no denying that. Policing is a problem. There are problems with guns. We have too many guns. There are too many murders. There are too many black people being killed by police. This is the truth of things, sweetie. It's not different than that. What's so scary about saying that? What's so scary about knowing that? and how to participate with that. How about not, by not knowing, not knowing how to participate and then just doing something, right? just doing something, something for now. And let's let, let that speak for itself. Let that be a contribution towards repair. Collective responsibility, my part, my part. I'm gonna take responsibility for my lineage for my ancestry. I'm going to take responsibility for my children. Take responsibility and participate. So no need to even reject those moments where things really hurt, but we can let them flow, receiving it as nature, offering back. This is what we learn we can learn by chanting. It's just something I've learned by chanting. Is that those words dissolve into the ether. They just dissolve, they're, they're no longer. And orienting the heart in the direction of the skillful with loving kindness, with taking refuge, with remembering that I have a commitment to being skillful by reciting the precepts. 
I learn how to, we learn how to return back to nature, all of the expressions of reactivity. There's no sense in holding on to that, claiming it as mine, appropriating something that is just nature. There's no sense in doing that. That doesn't help. Tanisara says, awakening is not a static state we reach where we never experience conflict, pain, or suffering. This is a childish idea of enlightenment. A trap in meditation is aiming for a special experience, hoping it will remove us from life's challenges and transform us into a super spiritual, Teflon-like power person who has all the answers. Instead, awakening is humbling because we have to concede our fundamental state of unknowing and understand our deepest nature is a mystery. As the awakening process integrates into our life, we are not lifted up and out of our challenges. Instead, as take, it takes us down and through the layers of our personal and collective unconscious. As we become more aware, what is held in the shadow is illuminated. Inevitably, we meet wounds related to themes of belonging, acceptance, safety, self-love, and self-expression. To me, that sounds like nothing is left out. You can take responsibility for it all and it doesn't have to be a problem. So just a handful of days practicing through chanting and receiving, giving and receiving in a very integrated way. And this heart feels a lot more capable, a lot less burdened in this moment. <laughs> Just a few minutes left, but thank you for receiving what I've had to offer tonight. Wondering if there are any, if anybody wants to add something. And perhaps before we end, I'll just say a public thank you to Patrice for holding it down last week. It was nice to be here and receive the Dharma, beautiful Dharma and see everybody in the room. Maybe we'll just turn it over to Patrice for, a, for sharing of the merit. Well, friends, let's uh, together participate in this beautiful act of imaginative generosity, sharing the merit. Reflecting on our evening, if there is any benefit, any merit, any goodness to our practice tonight, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. If we could, we would in fact give it all away, every bit of it. We'd give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our community. We'd give it to persons we like persons we don't like. We give it to all humans everywhere. And in addition to the two leggeds, we give the blessings to the four leggeds, 
the many legged, the winged, the fin, the scaly, the slithery, all beings everywhere. May all beings find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. 